<clears throat> so we have a we have a, a, a of course an agenda for today uh, where um, we will be um, obviously talking about uh, the coronavirus, but also the impact on on uh, social determinants of health. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a little bit of introduction to the NIC as we get started here, and um, uh, but I want to just say a few words about today's webinar, and it's um, important to note that. Today is, uh, today's webinar is actually the first in a series that we'll be holding over the next uh, probably eight, nine months. So um, we do plan to have a, a number of uh, sessions for six weeks apart. Um, given the, the magnitude and the importance of this topic, even more so today uh, around uh, social determinants and how we can actually develop what we're calling a strategic action agenda. And um, I will talk more about that action agenda, uh, both during and later in, uh, later on in the conversation. Um, but one of the things we really are uh, interested in doing is uh, taking uh, the ideas and the action, the ideas into action, actually, the ideas into action. Uh, and particularly at this point in time, given, um, you know, just the onset of coronavirus, how much uh, top of mind it is for people and uh, how it's impacting both individually and, and personally and the disruptions it's, uh, it's having on everyone's lives and will continue to have. Uh, the, the, um, despite that, the good news today is we have two um, wonderful colleagues and experts who are gonna be helping us with the conversation. Uh, Dr. Karen Smith, um, former public uh, director of the public, uh, Department of Public Health in California and Dr. Forrest, who leads the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary uh, and a long distinguished career within the public health world. Um, the challenge today will be um, uh, <laughs> talking uh, not only about uh, the, the virus, but, uh, but the implications of that uh, for uh, what our collective uh, response will be. Uh, in the face of uh, social determinants and public health and all of the issues that are being exposed right now. Uh, one of the things we'll do is we'll be looking at both the domestic uh, aspects of it and also some of the international perspectives for context. And um, uh, PG Forrest has a, a long distinguished career, both understanding the US environment, but also internationally. And he's based in Canada now. Uh, and has worked and understands a lot of the international. And that perspective is important as we think about uh, the future, both for public health and social determinants and the impact of, of those things as well. As I said, um, we uh, are planning this uh, series of, of webinars uh, to address the issues and to develop actually a national policy. We think that at this point in time, it's important that we, that we really bring our collective wisdom and knowledge to the table to help direct a, a, a comprehensive but a thoughtful action uh, agenda. So what can we actually pragmatically do moving forward? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But we hope that that conversation, which will get launched today, will continue over the next number of months, both during the webinar sessions, but also in between the sessions. And part of the, um, part of the focus will be on the, on the hub itself and on the group, for those of you who have not signed up, um, there's a specific group on the hub that's called Social Determinants. Uh, it actually has uh, more people than any other groups. It's got about 800 people who have actually signed up um, for, uh, for, the, for the group, which is, uh, which is tremendous. And we expect to sort of, uh, sort of catalyze that group and work within that context to uh, have conversations, post different things, and actually work on this collective agenda as we go forward. The kinds of problems that we're talking about, and we'll be talking about shortly here, really speak to the reason, the real core reason why the NIC was formed in the first place, uh, which is to really have uh, the opportunity to have multidisciplinary cross-domain kinds of conversations. And this particular pandemic, this particular public health issue really underscores the importance of our a need for and perhaps our inability to share information as fluidly and as frictionlessly as possible and how that affects many of the other challenges that we face as we go forward. So it really does underscore the importance of all of the other conversations we've been having over the last number of months, looking at education, looking at public safety, looking at public health and healthcare services, and how do we inter interwine, uh, inter interweave and intertwine 
those disciplines to provide a comprehensive view uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a roadmap going forward to address this work. And crossing those silos is work that we've been doing for a long time. Um, so um, I'm excited about getting started today uh, and then uh, obviously continuing this. As I mentioned, our two presenters uh, today are uh, Dr. Forrest and Karen Smith. And I'm going to turn this over to them in just a minute. Um, we we do have some, you know some present some prepared presentations, but we will be looking for your engagement and participation and discussion around uh, what you're hearing and what this kind of agenda might look like for this community and the broader community across the country. Uh, please go forward one slide, Mike. And so in addition to that, we'll be uh, talking about uh, towards the end and some of the next steps for building the agenda, how we can continue the conversation. We'd like to form a project team to think about this action agenda and then prepare for broader, deeper conversations uh, as we go forward, both on these webinars and then as we move towards our annual symposium. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> oddly enough, we're in the, in, the, in, this, in the start of actually planning an in-person meeting uh, uh, which is targeting now the end of the year, December. Hopefully by then, uh, people will be uh, uh, getting back together again in, in physical locations. And we will be holding that event uh, with the Stanford University uh, Center for Population Health Sciences. Uh, and right now we're targeting for the end of the year to bring together a lot of the learning that we'll have had around this agenda development and the conversations, both around the topic and more broadly, and that will be a sort of a, a focus area for us for bringing together and really refining uh, that policy discussion. And we'll talk more about that over the weeks and months as we come forward. But just to know that there is a there is a, actually a process and a and a series of events that we'll be holding as we go forward. And then, as you can see on the upcoming, and we'll talk about that, we have uh, webinars scheduled uh, actually through mostly through the end of May here uh, on various topics of. Uh, in relation to uh, both population health, the opioid issue, and also uh, the WIN network, uh, which is a, uh, comes out of 100 million lives, healthier lives. I will be continuing to share that information with you as, as we go forward. So if you could please advance, Mike, one more. And so I, I, I briefly mentioned this already for those of you who may be uh, new to the um, to these sessions. Um, I think I see a lot of familiar names here. So the NIC is a, is a community of networks, as we describe it, as I said before, and it brings together learning and expertise and knowledge from multiple domains. The idea of that is to bring that together so we have a comprehensive cross-domain approach to uh, the work that we're doing. Again, in light of the coronavirus today, uh, the need for that ability to share across those domains is incredibly important. Um, we've documented some of that in the report um, and I think we can build on that as, as we go forward. A lot of that material, of course, is on the web, and it's a really um, a, um, a rich uh, source of information. The, the URL is right here, um, and I'm uh, going to now uh, make an executive decision. We usually do introductions, but um, what I want to do, uh, given the amount of time we have and the, and the, and the, uh, the rich content uh, discussion we want to have, I'm going to bypass that today. Um, and go right directly into um, the, uh, the first uh, uh, presentation and discussion that's going to be uh, provided by Karen Smith. And uh, if you can advance, Mike. Uh, many of you know Karen. Uh, she was the former director of the California Department of Public Health and has a long, uh, distinguished career in public health. And today, as she'll describe to us, uh, uh, is deeply involved right now in California addressing some of the issues. So that. Uh, very much uh, uh, current uh, involvement with it, um, it will, uh, will come to bear here. And as I said, also Dr. Uh, Dr. Forrest will be uh, following Karen's presentation and also inter interacting as we go forward with that. So with that uh, introduction, uh, Karen, thank you so much for making time. I know that your phone is ringing off the hook now from within California and across the country. Mm -hmm. um, our preparatory questions and conversations have been really stimulating and exciting. So. I, I look forward to your introductory comments here and, um, and take it away, as we say. Thanks. Could we go to the first slide? So um, I agreed to, to um, be a, a, a um, sort of moderator for this conversation over the next few months because I'm so 
um, frustrated at having ha talked about social determinants for years now, really gaining more and more understanding of how incredibly important there are. And um, yet we really don't, we have not fully affected any kind of action systematically to address this. There's, there's some very cool stuff going on out there, especially in the healthcare um, sector in terms of physician extenders and ways to do social influencing. We'll talk about that a little bit. But really to move upstream hasn't happened much. So um, I am going to, I know a lot of you out there know probably more than I do about this field, but I do want to level set to begin with um, a little bit about um, what we know about social determinants. Trust me, it's not going to be long. And then I want to talk about, I think, it, what's at top of mind for almost everybody um, these days, which is the COVID-19 uh, epidemic or now pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky to have been uh, to be able to be of use to several local jurisdictions here in California um, in terms of what that looks like, boots on the ground, trying to address that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about social determinants in that context. So let's go to the next slide. So again, apologies to all of you who, who know this, but I think it's important. I'm hoping we have some of our uh, technology uh, geeks on the line as well. Um, who maybe haven't been steeped in this quite to the same degree. Over the last um, sort of 50 years, the conversation in the United States in particular about how do we improve people's health has always been about making sure everybody has access to health care, making sure that health care is of high quality and affordable. Needless to say, we're not quite there, but we have made tremendous advancements. Um, however, what we also have seen is that Rates of chronic diseases continue to climb, climb overall health in general in the United States by most indicators um, is dropping. Um, and now even our, the most crude of our indicators, mortality rates are climbing, which is not something any of us really um, expected to see in our lifetimes and is very specific um, to a whole set of um, conditions and, and uh, diseases that um, have really come to the fore as we, until very recently, have sort of gotten a handle on a lot of the early um, causes of mortality like infectious diseases. Um, but I, what we have learned, and there is a lot of um, evidence obviously to support this, that that provision of, of health care services, clinical care, really is only about 20% of what determines your overall health. We also, we in public health have spent decades, um, at, in fact, hundreds of years, quite literally, addressing another really important area, which is health behaviors. No smoking, we were the people of no, don't smoke, don't eat fatty foods, um, don't do this, don't do that. But what we know now better is that those health behaviors, that's another 30%. So now we're only up to about 50%. And these are, you know, these numbers vary. It doesn't actually matter which direction you go. It's the relative proportions that are important. Um, Together, health behaviors, which is traditional public health and, and clinical care is really only 50% of what determines someone's long-term health outcomes. And I think as you most, most of you know, really the most powerful single determinant is this cluster of things um, called social and economic factors, education, income, housing, et cetera. And then the physical environment is incredibly important as well. Sorry, housing is actually in, it doesn't, you know, we can move these little boxes around. Bottom line, where you live, how you live, what your opportunities are in life, particularly starting in childhood, um, all are even more powerful determinants of long-term health than is the access to healthcare. So that's kind of the context. I wanna um, now, if we go to the next slide, talk about the P word, the pandemic in the, in the context of social determinants. And the next slide, please. I just love this picture, so I wanted to put it in there. Oh, we're gonna have a poll. So on this, you're, you're running the poll, right? I see a slide that says poll one. Is that actually happening? Yep. Mike. Yep, okay, good. Can we go to the next slide then? Oh, I see, give people a few minutes to do this. 
Um, so this is, we are, we are, we had a lot of conversation going on because of the pandemic around home quarantine, um, me, which means you, you are mandated to stay home for a minimum of 14 days. That's if you don't have anyone in your household who has COVID and is continuously exposing you. If you do, it could be much longer. So I want you to think about what you would do if today we told you you have to stay home and can't go out for the next 14 days and what that would how that would impact you and your ability to do the things that you um, really need to do to continue the lifestyle that you currently enjoy so let's go to the next slide when you're ready i'm not sure so just how sure. long you want to let it run but uh, yeah. we're we're up to 60 percent still Great. coming in uh, okay, so we'll give it a couple of minutes. So I, you know, when I, we were first talking about this, uh, have, well, this, this uh, uh, webinar has been planned for quite a long time, um, that we did not expect to be in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so I, my talk would not have included a pandemic had I um, actually been doing this in the absence of COVID-19. But since it is uh, we are where we are, and because so many decisions are being made right now that have a direct impact on people's lives, both people who already have chronic diseases, but also people, uh, kids who are, are um, very young, I want to, like, I think it gives us a good context to talk a little bit about um, what, it, what it would take. Now, looking at the poll results here, only about 17% of you said it would be very difficult for you uh, or have a significant impact on your family or your life or livelihood. And that reflects who we are on this, on this conference call. We're overall well-educated, in some cases like mine, probably over-educated. Um, we have jobs. Most of us would not be doing this if we didn't have a job. We probably have access to sick leave and we have my guess is uh, for many of you who have young children, have some, either those, those children are in school and have childcare, et cetera. So let's go to the next slide and look at um, what it looks like for some other people. Can we advance one? Yeah, there we go. So in this, I put one of uh, the sort of common graphics that we use um, to talk about the most, the sort of upstream. This is really, I'm talking really, what is it about how you grow up and how you live now, what you have access to that makes this, the impact of this pandemic more or less impactful on you and your, and in some cases, long-term. So educational attainment, I think you can see here, you don't, we don't think about this, but the ability, the problem solving skills that come with having had a good education, particularly a postgraduate education, health literacy, incredibly important. When this is, this, this graphic was not made for this instance. Health literacy is something that helps you be healthy all the time. But imagine if you didn't understand even sort of the most basic things about health, except for I feel sick and I see my doctor, how important understanding health and disease and transmission and all those terms would be to helping you understand what's happening right now, why people are doing the things that they're doing. Also, people with high educational attainment tend to have jobs in which they have an actual belief that they can control things in their environment. This can have a two, this is a two way edge. It mostly it's very beneficial for us because we know how, we believe that we can, uh, we have power in certain circumstances. We can, we can make decisions that will help us, et cetera. For people who basically feel are in low income jobs or jobs where they have minimal autonomy and they're just given task by task by task, that does not engender the belief that you have any control of your circumstances. So something like a pandemic where we're seeing pictures of overrun hospitals, et cetera, is, is intensely frightening and, and um, creates stress. Status, obviously, really important um, because you know how to get what you need you have a certain amount of status being who you are and having the job that you have. You are in a, probably most of us, um, I'm retired now, but you're in a, in most of you in a place where you have access to healthcare and um, can 
really you have sick leave so you can go to the doctor if you need to or take time off if you need to, et cetera. Um, and obviously we all have social networks and those social networks are important because in day-to-day -day life, they get you the things that you need. They, you can learn from your colleagues, et cetera. Um, people who are isolated suffer both day-to-day -day from diseases more profoundly um, outside in, under normal circumstances. N being isolated in a time of generalized fear and even concern or stress in the community is profoundly negative on your health status. Um, and I'm just gonna, I wanted to talk about that one because I think it's the most broad. Income, obviously, these are all interconnected, but um, the, the opportunity to have health insurance, um, good housing in a, in a nice neighborhood where maybe you can go outside and walk around without being in, in uh, direct contact with people all the time. And then also, sorry, I'm stopping to look ooh, at my, uh, my time. All right, you, um, the other thing that comes, if we move down to look at race, how is race playing out in this particular um, epidemic? Well, a lot of people um, who have been historically uh, marginalized have a real lack in government. And right now, government is up front in people's faces in terms of how we're dealing with um, this pandemic all the way from things like people telling you that you are ordered into isolation or quarantine to the government making decisions about your child's um, school status, et cetera. It's terrifying. We've already seen stigma start to play out in, in really unfortunate ways. Um, initially around um, people with, of Asian descent, in, and, but now even more people who maybe have COVID who don't want to tell anybody, who don't want to be off sick because all their, their coworkers are going to know that they have it. Um, the, um, in, on the flip side, it is true that in some communities, African-American community and Latino community, they actually have stronger support systems when it comes to family. So that can actually be, just, these are obviously gross um, um, categorizations. And then I'm going to skip environment. I think you can, you can see that um, it, it also plays an effect. But I want to move on now for just a minute because I do uh, want to talk just a little bit about how those of us in public health think about social determinants. I'm moving away now from the, um, the uh, straight up um, pandemic to talk about um, sort of our framework for thinking about things. This particular um, framework is one of my favorites because on the right end, that's downstream, that's that medical care, access to health, and risk factors that, that I talked about a little earlier. We know about those, we know how to, uh, we have ways of addressing those. The bigger issue and the place where we need more action and a more concerted systematic effort is in those factors that influence those downstream factors. Living conditions is perhaps the most obvious and concrete one. Let's, you know, let's deal with land use planning so that it's more equitable. Because for public health, our ultimate goal is not just health, but health equity. Everyone should have an equal and just opportunity to, to be healthy. Um, but those, those changes in living conditions are not, those differentials in living conditions, they're not random. They, they directly derive from institutional inequities, things like um, how government has been set up, you, where schools are, good schools. Schools are paid for by property taxes. Property taxes are low in low income places. So your schools, therefore downstream, become much poorer. And that has profound effects for everyone going through these schools. So uh, that's an area where we really need to work more institutionally to look where inequities are being driven. And then of course, the upstream ones, the really difficult ones to address are social inequities, class, race, ethnicity. We're seeing immigration status play out dramatically, um, gender, sexual orientation, the list goes on. Those are historic, they're cultural, they only change slowly and they change when we change some of those other inequities and rise up and make um, more consistent and more equitable the rest of our, our communities. So let's move on. Oops, sorry, uh, Sundas, I blocked the chat box. So I haven't been able to look at the, yeah. I'm trying to be able was, to see my slides at the same time. Karen, so there was one. There's something. There was, Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, there was just one, one question and just for a pause for a second. Carolyn, 
was asking whether or not any of the frameworks were citable, or was this work yeah. that was happening within the within the department or the, within the no there so there's very there's a lot of versions this particular framework has been de developed over the past 10 years this is the most recent iteration by uh, a group of health officials from around the san francisco the greater san francisco bay area that's called the bay area health inequities initiative came together to talk about how do we create health equity um it's a group that works together a lot and um it all, these same group of health officials are the ones who are, are trying to deal with the pandemic now in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is um, pretty heavily impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing I want, this is, um, I'm wrapping up now, two really important things. As we start to talk about what can we actually do? What action can we take? What policy agendas can we move forward? We have to realize that this term social determinants of health is being used slightly differently in different sectors. Most importantly, in the, the healthcare system <clears throat> and in public health. I've talked already about what we mean by, by um, social determinants of health in public health. We're looking at what what changes can we make in policy systems in the environment, not just to help people now, but to move upstream so that our public health's way of decreasing costs is always preventing things in the first place. And only secondarily, you know, secondary in, in, um, in prevention means making something that already exists not get worse, and tertiary is even further downstream than that. So we want to move upstream, and that typically requires that we intervene in multiple areas, policy systems and environment. A big burden hurdle for us has been having multi-sector interoperable data that we can use to say, see, look, if this, then that, that brings those things together, um, the systems that are in place as well as the environment. The other, um, the other thing, we, we focus not just on the health of individuals, but even more as our primary mission, the health of communities. And the only way to improve the health of communities is to address those upstream factors. And you'll see there, I said already, our underlying goal is health equity. And we do want to decrease costs to the healthcare system, but we believe that the way to do that is in addition to other things, making sure we address those early determinants of health and resiliency so that communities and the individuals in them, uh, we are in conditions that engender health from the get-go. Healthcare, appropriately, is more focused on addressing those immediate social factors that can help people with chronic diseases, in particular our high utilizer populations, to not need the healthcare system so much, right? So that we decrease costs, the so-called frequent flyers, et cetera. If we provide housing to homeless people who have diabetes, will they do better? If we create a physician extenders, promotoras, uh, community health workers, et cetera, can we keep those people from having um, to go back into the hospital. And the dr overall driver, let's face it for this, is de decreasing the cost of the healthcare system. And we need to do that as a society because it takes money out of every other system. And we just shouldn't have such poor health in a country that is as well resourced as America. Okay, next slide. I think that's actually Oh, we have a, a, a quick poll. This is to um, let you weigh in on, as we create this action agenda, we do not have a plan. We don't know what it looks like. We want to know how this, how you in the audience want to address this conversation. Do you really want, is the, is the focus where you believe we can make the most, the biggest difference and where we should focus our attention is on addressing um, social determinants of health, specifically, or social influencers or social supports. There's lots of terms for it. But for people who are dependent on the healthcare system and um, costing a lot of money, frankly, can we help those individuals stay healthier in between need to use the healthcare system? Do you think we should focus on the upstream determinants of health to try to improve long, long term health outcomes? And or do you think that the, the, the most important thing for us to think about really are those racial and or economic disparities in underserved populations? So we're, we're intentionally not giving you an all of the above 
because what we're interested in seeing is kind of um, a differential between what are, these are three big buckets of areas where um, we think there needs to be an action taken or an action agenda. We need movement, real work um, being done and being implemented. But where's the priority? Um, where should we uh, be sure that we're focusing most? So take a couple of minutes for that. I'm probably a little bit over time here, okay. uh, Daniel, but I think that's actually okay. my last slide, except for a couple of, of <clears throat> How do communities re re revive their um, eroding social cohesion? That is an excellent question. Um, it's really not possible to, to ask, answer it shortly. It has a lot to do with building the social networks that are necessary to advocate um, and, and starting with what you do have, what, if it's, if it's uh, faith communities or if it's PTA, find the places where there is already cohesion and start to build partnerships between those. Um, Daniel, this might be, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to blog on some of these topics in between meetings. And I think this is a great um, question, uh, eroding social cohesion, because we know that communities that have good social cohesion are actually some of the most resilient. Mm -hmm. um, that that can be more important in certain kinds of disasters. We saw this in Katrina and we've seen it in several other natural disasters. Um, they survive better. It doesn't outweigh some of the other factors, but it's really important. <clears throat> yeah, and if you have ideas on what are some of the other ways to address social, we would like to address it in as many ways as possible. The one thing we wanna be absolutely sure to do is be actionable. Um, we want to go from just having cocktail party conversations about how important all this stuff is to really having something that we can do. Um, and so it, please do um, send in your ideas about what are some uh, potential ways to address it. This is a conversation that's gonna evolve and it's not me or Daniel or Adam or, or PG who are gonna drive this conversation, it's the group. So this is interesting. <clears throat> So we've got uh, addressing approaches, uh, approaches to addressing racial or economic disparities is um, in the lead at 63%, upstream 50, I love you guys, because <laughs> those, are, those are my, that just warms my public health heart, thank you so much. But still recognizing with a good, almost a quarter of, of folks that we really do have to think about this um, very, uh, very downstream, but very impactful area of, of helping people with chronic diseases. Okay, I think let's move on because I'm very sensitive to time. Um, let's find the next thing. I think this is the end. My, my finishing thing is that top uh, graphic is my um, sort of poor attempt to show what I think is that how do we move from straight you know, emergency department care, hospitalizations, to include interventions in people's homes that can help them navigate their specific challenges to really what, what things, what's the healthcare system's role in healthy communities? How do, and they, they have roles. I have, we, we know what some of those roles are, but I think, and that's something that we need to talk about because taking action requires identifying who are those actors. But we also need, and this, is, uh, this, is, um, this graphic on the bottom is actually from a book. It's sort of a coffee table book about moving from talking about prevention as primary, secondary, tertiary, or the other versions of it to saying, we need to develop a system of prevention where communities are, are continue, they have ownership for health. They are advocating for the things that they know, fixing the things that they know are, are compromising their health. Bam, the communities, the, that means individuals are involved, but also community organizations are involved, but also restructuring some of those um, institutional biases that exist. I mean, I just put that there to say, we, yes, we need to do all of the above. We need to create communities and a way of um, living and that actually engenders health. We do not have that in, that in this country. Some of us who are really you know, wealthy and have a lot of resources may have that, but the vast majority of America, we are fractured. And I think that's gonna be a good um, segue into um, PG's conversation. So Daniel, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. I'm for, I'm, 
I apologize because of the time I haven't been able to um, to answer the, uh, some of these. I agree with you that um, addressing chronic diseases actually and, and those social supports can be really important in some of our most profoundly affected communities, our low income communities, communities of color. And I agree with that. And I think that is an, an important nexus to start to grow coalitions in those communities that then can ha begin to have power. And that's kind of fundamental in sort of the accountable communities for health models, which some of you may be aware of. And the, uh, the ROI, that's an interesting question. We, because we have so little data and because the timelines, particularly for the most upstream interventions, are challenging, but we have increasing information about this. And that, I think this would be another good topic to blog on. So Daniel, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to you, I think, to introduce PG. Yeah, I'm gonna just take a moment here for a couple of minutes. We're good, we're actually good on time. Uh, so PG, okay. we'll, we'll come back to you in just a second here, but uh, I just want to open it up and see, you know, there's some questions on here relative to uh, what you're hearing now. Um, you know, are there, are there things that are jumping to mind that, that we want to make sure we address here or that people want to uh, bring to the table for a couple minutes here? You just have to unmute yourself if you want to say a few things. Uh, this is Leslie with um, the Center for Population Health Sciences. I loved um, your presentation, near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, and our center is focused on the social determinants of health. And as you can imagine, at an academic um, institution, we want to do something to help. And we have people approaching us um, from many different places. From your perspective, what in what ways could a university be most helpful in terms of uh, COVID-19, and especially on the social determinant side? Wow, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, well, so well, univers universities are, are incredibly important. Um, and um, because what, so I think one of the things that we've lacked in public health in particular and in our, in our thinking about social determinants of health is that we are sorely lacking in understanding how um, the, what, so, what the social sciences know about humans and how humans interact. Um, in terms of the immediate, um, uh, the immediate pandemic, um, I think it's, well, I'm not sure how real time it is. I have to think a little bit more about that. But, but we are going to, we are already learning a lot about how people and groups of people um, respond to these kinds of, of emergencies and, and, and in particularly infectious disease emergencies because they're so fraught already. Um, having, having academic institutions be really like paying attention to the signals out there um, that are telling us, you know, what reactions are to things and, and looking at it from the academic perspective, we, we need to capture some of these learnings. And, and we don't, in public health, I've got to tell you right now, I don't know a single person who's not flat out working on, on uh, communicable disease control. So the ability to really sort of look um, system wide at, how communities are, are reacting, um, how messaging is working. You know, there's academic institutions have so many things other than just health that, that we don't right now have the bandwidth to look at. They th that I think is one of the most important ways that academic institutions can help. The other thing is partnering with public health, particularly in your local communities to say, is there something we can do? Are there ways that we can help? You have really smart people and you have those, those people and your, your systems of communication have huge reach. We need people amplifying the right messages, messages that um, message the concern so that people are paying attention, but also what to do. And the other area that we are gonna to start to see even more in America that we've seen elsewhere is how do we keep people 
how do we address people's mental health during these times when we are when we are under so much stress and where we are putting in restrictions that just normally don't happen so i think that you've got a lot of people who can think very critically about what questions we, should we be asking and then seeing what what you know it's your it's sort of a um, it's not data as we usually think of data in terms of um, numbers and that sort of thing, but it's important information that we're going to want to learn from. We have we have been planning for things like mass, you know, school closures, et cetera, for decades. We've never had to use them. And so we need to capture as many of the learnings as we can from this experience so that we're better prepared next time. So don't just look, but also tell us when you know, help us plan in the future. How do we do it better? How, what do we do differently so that we're most, more successful? Particularly, I think, not so much in the realm of, well, yes, communicable diseases. That's where we're going to need a lot of data but of the kind that healthcare facilities collect and, and um, communities collect. But in terms of taking care of people um, who yeah. are being impacted. All right, that's probably a long-winded response, but it's such an exciting question. That was extremely helpful. Thank you. Leslie, I think that's one of the things we're going to be looking for as part of this action agenda is, is kind of what is the research agenda, right? What, what do we know? What don't we know? And as we start to think about the multidisciplinary nature of this, how do we structure it? Um, because, you know, cross silo work is not common. And we know that, and we see a number of questions here on, you know, the uh, the influence and the impact on the on the private sector as well as the as well as the public sector, is there an opportunity for us to be learning more and be able to mobilize um, resources and outreach communication, all those kinds of things? Um, so one of the things we'll we'll definitely get back to is what is that research agenda? Um, and in some of the upcoming calls we're going to be having, we have uh, uh, AHRQ coming on in a couple of weeks to talk a little bit about the research that they're doing at the federal level on SDOH and on opioids. So I think we can bring together a lot of different partners and players in this in this conversation, and focus it in on what is that what would be really most understandable and actionable. Um, so I know we're capturing a lot of the questions here. As, as Karen said, we want to make sure that um, um, that we um, capture a lot of these questions online, because this, we do have limited time here today. We want to engage in that conversation. So both. DJ and Karen have, uh, have certainly offered to sort of participate to help moderate that, but I encourage all of us to get into that conversation and to learn from it. And when it's on there, then it becomes sort of a, a little bit of a library there. And so with that, uh, PG, let me turn to you. Um, you just posted uh, uh, a comment here about uh, faculty from your, uh, from your school, uh, recommendations of uh, disparities within the context of uh, C-19 pandemic. Um, I've had the great, uh, great pleasure and fortune, good fortune of, of working with uh, Dr. Forrest, both when uh, at the, uh, the John Hopkins uh, School uh, a number of years ago when we were doing our events there, and really gained a, a great appreciation for the breadth and the depth of knowledge and the humor that he can bring to a, a topic uh, like this. Uh, so with that, PG, um, the microphone is yours, um, and let's uh, you know, help us understand sort of the larger context here. Okay, first slide, please, and good morning, everyone. I'm, um, I'm really uh, honored and pleased to be here. You cannot see me because I live on the other side of the Northern Wall. Um, I'm a, a sort of intruder in this conversation, but I'm, Karen and, and Daniel insisted that I may have something to contribute this morning, um, in, in part because um, it, I, I think it's not a bad idea to look at the way those questions are framed outside of the United States. And it gives a better idea of the type of challenges, but also advantages you may have in your, in your particular context. And um, those questions have been around for a long time. You know, I've, uh, in, in other circumstances, when I, Daniel invited me to talk about the history of this concept of social determinants of health, I mentioned that, for instance, in, in my own country, in Canada, the, the four factors that Karen identified at the beginning of her talk this morning uh, were embedded in a public uh, official Canadian government report in 1974. And so have be, this, this frame has been around 
when when we develop policies in Canada since then. It's the Lalonde report from the, the name of the minister of the time. But so elsewhere in the world, this has been a conversation that um, people have had for 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 many decades, actually. Maybe the next slide. Um, so what, what, I, what I wanted to do this morning is give you a, a, a sense of the way the conversation has been uh, unfolding elsewhere. Um, and my, my sense at, 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 uh, at this moment is that in, in the U.S., when I look at the conversation, I have difficulty to clearly identify what is the goal you're pursuing. And it's, it was clear again in the in the poll, we the second poll that Karen uh, organized uh, this this morning. Um, in, when, when you look at the way people are seeing the relationship, for instance, and I think this is the the, the crux of the of the matter, the, the relationship that exists between health services or or health policy and the other areas of social policy, you could see that there are basically three major perspectives that. I have identified here. But again, I think one of the goals we could pursue with this new initiative from Steward of Change is, is, is to try to clarify what, what, what is the goal that in the end we would like to pursue in the context of the American social and health uh, uh, system. The three perspectives here, I, I've called one the welfare state perspective because basically it, 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 it originates from, from the, the creation of the welfare state, mostly in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom during and just after World War II. The idea there is that essentially um, you're, you're seeing health policy as part of a, of, a, of, of a few essential policies that are intended for social progress, for social integration, and, uh, and there is no privilege, at least at the start, uh, attributed to the health policy sector compared to the other sectors. And I, uh, bear with me, I will, I will go further in that direction in a, in a few minutes. The other perspective has, has been dominating the, the conversation in northern, uh, northern Europe countries like Sweden and Denmark. And it, the idea is that essentially um, health is, is, is a program. It's not really a policy. The, the goal is slightly different. It's not social integration. It's participation of all citizens in the cultural, economic, political life of the nation. And finally, uh, this human rights perspective, and I was struck last night to see a, um, a, a tweet from Bernie Sanders, for instance, you know, saying, well, health is a human right. And this is a, a different perspective. So one is centered on social integration. The second one is centered on participation, the idea that you shouldn't left uh, you shouldn't leave anybody behind. Again, a theme that's quite familiar for you as ears. And, and the, the last one is the idea of empowering people um, that, and, and giving them entitlement and the capacity to make claim against, against the states or against social institutions to receive services. Next slide, please. So th this is a, an actual page of the of the beverage report of 1942. This is the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence of the Welfare State. This is the really the founding document. It's still a very inspiring document. Um, the so two things in that in that particular uh, uh, quote. The first thing is this idea of three principles, and I think they are still very much uh, current. The first one is saying. If you want to do that, if you want a better integration of health and other social policies, but also education and, and housing and so on and so forth, you will meet sectional interests that will be opposed and that will block that, that, uh, that tribe of transformation. And I really like this, the, the last sentence of the paragraph that says, paragraph seven, a revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching. And I think maybe this is what this C-19 crisis will help us to do and say maybe we, we are at the moment where we could do things that we were not thinking were doable before. The second principle has to do with this, this bundle of fundamental policy. So the language is a little strange for our modern, uh, modern uh, you know, conception. The, he's talking about one, disease, ignorance, etc. But it's still very easy to identify that 
what he was asked to provide is some form of welfare payment, but he said this is not enough. We need also to take into account disease, which has been the funding act for the National Health Service in Britain, ignorance, so a, a very progressive policy of, of education, squalor addressing the problem of housing and illness, employment. Those are the, our basic social determinants of health as we know them at, uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. And the third principle that is very important for us because in our, our political culture, our, our, our Western institutions, our premise on the idea that we, we, we want to have an open society, we want to have a society in which there is still an element of individual responsibility and autonomy. And that was part also of the thinking behind this, this particular approach. Next slide, please. So uh, the way you could apply this thinking, I was thinking, let's go back to the C-19 example. So when you talk about, about want, it, it's clear that in the current crisis, it is very important for individual and it is part of the, of the policies that have been addressed by my colleagues that you want people to have the financial capacity, for instance, to self-quarantine. It's, it's essential that they are able to, when you, you tell people you need to have reserve for two weeks, you still have to have the money to do so. And when people are living from one paycheck to another, it is very complicated. Access to care, disease is in the language of beverage, but in our language, we know that access to care is essential, especially for people that have a limited capacity or, or, or financial capacity or insurance. Um, we're, we have not discussed this morning, but literacy is a big problem and what we're living through at this moment. I don't know for your concrete situation in the U.S., but I'm also very much involved in this file here on the other side of the border. And how do you carry clear instructions to people? How do you make sure that they are able to, to read the material that is prepared by public health uh, services and, and ministries of health is a real issue. Of course, housing, we have Calgary is one of the city in Canada with the largest population of homeless people. And of course, it's an issue in, when you're facing a, an epidemic. And I, I, you know, being Americans, you don't need to be told about health insurance and the problem of, uh, of paid sick leave, um, where employment and a good employment is really a criteria even more in your situation that in mind for access for, for this. Next slide, please. So why we need this, this big approach? Why, why we need this, this all-encompassing uh, social determinants approach in which we are trying to consider uh, health and education and employment and housing and social security and, and so on and so forth. The, the, the three main arguments are integration of all those services will facilitate the efficient distribution of cost and responsibilities in society. It, 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 it shouldn't be the, the most expensive part of the system that is providing social support. And this is what will happen in, the, in, the, in, in a system in which uh, there is not good communication interoperability, as we like to say, say it now, between the different uh, pillars of, uh, of social policy. Universality um, encourages proper funding of common services. I, you know, the, the idea that services for the poor are poor services come from the United States. And, and this is an experience we, we have made time and again in Canada, that if you have universal services, people tend to, there is a broad support, there is a broad fiscal support for the services, but there is also a push from people that are literate and powerful for those services to achieve a, a certain degree of quality. People are, you know, this is lifeboat ethics. We're, we're all in the same lifeboat, and so we, 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 we want to make sure that we have as much food as it is possible, as much water as it possible, and that the conditions are, are bearable. And, 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 um, and finally, a perspective that, that includes health as a sort of human right, of course, will contribute to the coverage of, of uh, much more services than uh, if, if you don't, because it, it creates a pressure and a claim for an expanded basket of, uh, 
of service. And we have seen that re reproductive rights during the Obamacare, during the Obama administration, of course, is it, a very good illustration of that, uh, of that particular uh, dynamic. Next slide, please. So what is the, why there is this American exception? Why, again, my, my, my partial and, and maybe uninformed perspective of being a foreigner and looking at, at your reality. The thing that has always struck me in the U.S. is the incredible wall, the thick and very high wall that exists between health care and other areas of social policy. The logic is not the same. The actors are different. Their preoccupation, their training, and of course the, the wealth that is spent on health compared to the other sector of health policy create a, many difficulties in terms of, of communication. There is also a tension, a value tension of, you know, I, I, I remember and have read many, many times in, on blogs and editorials coming from uh, conservative, uh, the conservative media and so on about, uh, you know, that social provision of any type of service encourage, uh, it, it's perverse encouragements or that it encourages people to cheat, it encourages people for, it encourages illness and, and, and so on. And, and I think that th there, is, there is a tension that is probably unique to the United States that market solutions are, are, are seen all the time as the first possible solution for the, the resolution of any problem, which is not the case in the culture of most other developed countries. Um, underlying issues of race and poverty, my, my own experience in the, in the United States is when you start talking about social policy, people hear not, they, they don't hear the word social policy, they hear the word race and poverty. Well, when I talk about social policy in my own country or when I work in Europe, people are thinking, no, this is also for the middle class. If, if I have a universal daycare system like that, the one that exists in Quebec, Canada, or the one that exists in France or, or Spain, and, and people are not thinking of this is social policy, but people don't see that as directly related to, to race or poverty. It is open for, for all. And of course, it's partly our experience here, but it's, it's certainly amplified because of the size of your, of your country. Uh, the fracture that, uh, between health and, and social policy is amplified by federalism and, and the incredible fragmentation of, of authority. Next slide. So my, my, my conclusion here is, you know, what, what, are the, what will be the benefits of adopting this perspective in which we try to integrate all the pillars of social policy together, creating a, a more seamless type of, of approach um, to, uh, to the problems that we are trying to resolve. I think the, the first one is that the United States has, has it, and I think it's one of the, of the strength of the, of the health system of the U.S., they, there, there are some, and one of them is clearly that it is driven by this incredible appetite for innovation. And I think I, uh, creating the same appetite and the same drivers for social innovation would be very positive. I think that we will all like, and this is very much aligned with what Karen explained um, very brilliantly in the first part, you know, that we, we want to have tools that give us the possibility of intervening early in, in the, not only upstream, but very early in the life of individual. And, this integration makes it possible. There are, of course, direct benefits, and we have demonstrated that many times, better medical outcomes, for instance. You know, if I, if I, if I let you leave the hospital, but um, that you're, you're, you're going back to a, a, a context of social isolation and, and a lack of resources, the odds that you will be back uh, are extremely high, and they have nothing to do with the quality of the medical act that was performed originally. And I think the, the capacity of having the integration of services at this individual level is my big hope for the, for the American system. Savings, um, work we have done here in, in Calgary and with some of my, my colleagues, we, we have shown that repeatedly. Uh, uh, one of my, my colleagues uh, released a paper uh, two weeks ago showing that every dollar spent in housing is actually 
producing two dollars of saving in justice and health cost. Every dollar you spend on housing will generate two dollars of savings in uh, in criminal justice and in in um, in health uh, services. This is fabulous, and so we need to encourage that more. It will encourage and. The, the, the social mobility in the U.S. at this moment is, is as, at its lowest, and in part it, it's because of this issue of social cohesion. So um, I, I, I really think that we, we, we could, through this approach, encourage um, and, and restart the, something that has been fundamental in the history of the United States. And of course, what is fascinating and every one of you that is involved in this concretely knows it, is that this is a self-improving process. This is a process in which every time I, 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 I do a new pro project, I'm learning something that I could apply and, and disseminate. And, and, and so we're talking not about something for which we need a textbook now, but something that will be continuously self-evolving and improving. On the other side, at this moment, of course, a lot of variations in practice. Expectations of citizens are not always very clear, and they, here it's the same. They tend to go to the health system first instead of trying to see their problem, putting hope in other type of services. We, we, we haven't necessarily um, uh, trained our, our, um, our, our workforce to work with this type of, of, uh, of perspective. Funding for those kind of approaches is difficult to find, takes time to, to implement. Even myself, it's always easier to manage risk than to manage uncertainty. And again, this is something that the C-19 crisis is showing us. You know, it's always easier to say, I, I know that this particular patient or this particular client, um, the odds are blah, 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 rather than thinking, Let's try something different and, and see what will come out of this process. And of course, bureaucracies and, and organizations, public organizations in particular, are very resistant when you're telling them, I want to take a chance on this particular client or on this particular patient. I think that by sending him home, I may be able to do something that uh, will be different from what we have ex experienced in the past. And I mentioned the problem of authority already. So this is all for me. Thank you so very much. And of course, I'm uh, all the references and the and the, the the my 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 own sources. I will share with uh, with uh, with the the group and the blog afterwards. So don't don't uh, yeah. Uh, very easy for me to do. So PG, this is Karen. If I could just, I want to um, comment. You you beautifully illustrated what we call the wrong pocket problem, which is you, the investment in housing um, reaps investments in other sectors. We in this in this country have real challenges with well, who pays for the investment in housing? Um, because there is no entity that is that has an interest in in all of those systems improving which can offset because we're so siloed in our sectors so if i invest in housing and the correctional system saves money how, how does that help me we need to that's why we in public health talk, talk about communities but communities at least from the um the structural governmental context in the u.s don't really you know Every, there's a different payer in each of those silos, and we don't we don't understand how to um, say it's good if it's good for either sector. I'm not saying that very articulately, but I think you know what I mean. Karen, two things here. I, I think that there there are two ways we could, and I think this is a very important question for the future of this conversation, of course. But I think there's two ways to approach this. The first one is to say we could create incentives for large health organizations and or for insurers to address part of this. That's, and, and, and in part, as you know, the Accountable Care Act was trying to do that. Yep. Not necessarily in a perfect way, but the, the direction taken at the time was really going in the right place. 
and and I have I've, I've seen that from my own eyes. You know, when when large hospital systems start to be preoccupied by housing, or when the I remember at Hopkins the the, the big Hopkins complex starting to discover. You know, I, I've been in a meeting where surgeons that have never talked to anybody in the community in their life where suddenly, because of the incentives built in the ACA about readmission and quality of care, we're sitting with community organizers and discovering that, you know what, with very little money, actually, you could help someone that will bring food to your patient after an operation, and so on and so forth. That was fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I'm of course, very concerned by the way those things are evolving now um, uh, because of the change of philosophy and orientation. The other thing is insurers that it, in some cases have, have a real incentive, if, especially if they're, they're forced to keep patients and clients for a very, very long time. Um, there is a strong incentive of learning about these things because it's a way also of saving. The most expensive part of what we do is criminal justice and health. Yep. So everything we can do to save in those two areas um, is it could be could be uh, I think very a convincing argument for payers, and if the the insurers are the payers, I think there is something we could do. And my other my other direction is that as as I in our in our conversation and when we were preparing this the talk this morning is that we need champions. We a very important outcome for me from the process we're starting this morning is to identify champions, people that will be able to, you know, like, like uh, remember at the beginning of the digital revolution 20 years ago when Apple started using apostles, you know, we will send people that are equipped to explain you could save money, you could save important amount of dollars by investing in those projects. But we need people to do that because we cannot just talk among them um, ourselves. We are all convinced of that. We need to start talking to the rest of the world. So that's a, that's a really great segue into sort of a, a little bit of an open conversation. Now we have about uh, 15 minutes or so. I want to talk a little bit about the action agenda, but I want to open it up for a second and see if there's any burning uh, comments people want to make uh, at, this, at this point. So, So before, Mel, as you're, as you're conjuring your thoughts here, one of the things just in response to that, two thoughts come to mind. One is a number of years ago, um, uh, actually uh, the Gates Foundation funded a, a real seminal study on a social return on investment study for early, care, early childhood education, uh, sort of updating the work that had been done uh, with Ypsilanti and those other studies around long-term uh, impact on children. And they, they produced a, a, a tremendous report on the social return on investment and the actual just quantitative return on investment that showed a, on the low end of four, for every dollar investment, a $4 return on the high end, a $17 uh, return. I may be familiar with that if you're involved with early care and education. That report, which was, you know, had Nobel economists on it, had sort of a, an amazing uh, set of folks who were contributing to it over an appropriate period of time, became, in, I think, the gold standard for many, uh, for a lot of advocacy work within legislation, legislators, legis, legislative bodies to actually fund early childhood and education because they had a definitive sort of SROI that they could go back to and say, yeah, investment here is going to affect us downstream. It's kind of like almost like building a road. You want to invest now, you're going to build a road, you're going to have a long-term impact of it. So I, I, I don't know if we have that same kind of um, sort of definitive report on us on social return you know, we know what the contributors are, but that might be something that uh, that it becomes part of the you know the action agenda. Is do we actually have a an SROI report? Um, and I'm curious. I don't know if anyone had, can point to that right now. Um, I know the work uh, you know at, uh, at Yale from uh, um, Taylor and others uh, started to look at some of that you know the balance between social investment and and, and healthcare, but. I'm not sure it got to the SRI. I know that you guys did some of that stuff in Canada and showed a pretty interesting return. But are, other, are there other examples out there? But do you remember from, uh, from uh, San Diego, Danielle, 
uh, Lauren Paler presentation, which yeah. um, and and she has this uh, m m a tool that you could use to to uh, to evaluate the return on on investment um, on uh, investing in some of those projects, even for a, a an individual organization. So I think that that's a that was that was quite interesting. Okay, we'll take a we'll take a look at that and see if that actually is going to provide the sort of substantive kind of thinking that we we're going to want on that. Um, I think the last couple of pages that you had on there uh, on your presentation are also present a nice you know sort of starting framework for uh, for our action agenda kind of conversation that we want to have. Uh, Mike, if you could go down a couple of slides, uh, I want to just talk about that a little bit uh, as we uh, come into the home. Yeah, there you go, perfect. So as, as we were preparing for this, and as both um, Karen and PG have just said, is what are we going to do next? You know, what is it possible that we can actually do? I'm encouraged by a number of the conversations I've been having or hearing uh, uh, actually from within different parts of the administration, within the Office of the National Coordinator. I think I mentioned this to some folks, maybe even on the last call, was at their national conference, while conferences were a thing, might have been the last large conference <laughs> I will have attended for a while, but it was a very large conference in DC. And it was impressive uh, to me because I know that the ONC, the Office of National Coordinator, has always been very focused on healthcare policy uh, around the Affordable Care Act, coming out of that electronic health records, HIEs, and all those kinds of things. And I think one of the things that I heard and saw in many of the presentations was the concept of, of social determinants of health. And there was a, there was a sense of discovery within uh, a lot of the people there that, that the, the lens needs to be expanded, the aperture needs to be broadened in terms of health policy, uh, not just healthcare policy, and that there needs to be consideration for SDOH. And so that was, that was very encouraging in terms of uh, seeing and hearing, uh, you know, the national coordinator uh, really start to think about that stuff. And we've had a number of interactions with them. Some folks are on the call or been on calls really looking at that. A number of folks are involved with them. So I think there's actually some receptivity to, um, to the idea of, of, of uh, how does social policy get intertwined and interwoven into health policy? Kind of the, the pretext for this conversation. Are they separate? How do they join them? And how now with all of these new rules and regulations that are coming out with TEFCA, the final rules on things, how do we make sure that this work is actually integrated into that work so we're not adding it on afterwards? I think that's one of the major opportunities that we, that we may have. Another quick point I would, I would, I would point out here is that uh, there are a number of initiatives that have now been released into, into the wild, so to speak, that have been actually appropriated and authorized, the Integrated Care for Kids. And I know there's some folks on the call this, this week and prior weeks that are actually looking at those kinds of cross-sector uh, communications and ways of sharing data and information across not only Medicaid and healthcare, but the social and human services and the public safety and, and the judicial, judicial as well as early care, early care and education. So there's some funded models out there as well as things that are happening across the states and counties that have been working on that, particularly some of the accountable care communities and accountable health communities that are out there. So I think there's some models to look at. Um, and so that's the idea of this, uh, this action agenda. Uh, it's a collective effort hopefully informed by research and experience to really develop um, national policies to guide action and implementation for social determinants or social care. Or as I was thinking about it the other day, is it just another word for social services? Um, how do we integrate social services into our healthcare environment? So that's the goal of where we're headed now over the, over the next year. We want to identify some of the most relevant and promising cross-domain policy drivers. I think we've addressed, uh, we've seen a couple of those today, or many of those today actually, and what might have the greatest impact. Uh, and then what can we actually do? You know, how do we design, organize, and produce a set of pragmatic, what we're calling plays, to guide the planning, research, teaching, testing, implementation, replication? Um, so there's, a, there's definitely a frame on action. There's a frame on what can we, we need to articulate this, but the scale and the scope of, of the potential to change, especially driven by the emergency situation we're, we're living in now, uh, whether this pandemic hopefully will present an opportunity that we'll be able to take advantage of. 
and what I would offer up and been offering now for a while is the this National Interoperability Collaborative, which we've had the great fortune of being able to uh, stand up with support of Kresge Foundation and others, um, uh, and develop what we're called this community of networks. So we will serve as the um, as the uh, convener. Uh, we invite everybody to participate. We invite other organizations. We've been reaching out to a number of other organizations and foundations and philanthropy and public and private sector to join this, participate in it, bring your particular perspective to the table to help identify champions and identify concrete activities to facilitate this, this work. And I think that is exactly what we want to encourage, invite you into participating in. And so on the hub itself, uh, there's a social determinant group there. Uh, it will be populating that with questions. We'll be populating it with uh, responses, papers. There's a lot of stuff up there already in terms of a repository. And I want to encourage folks to join into that and to be able to participate in this conversation. And importantly, um, step forward in terms of your willingness, your interest to actually participate in this. Uh, this actually the formation of this of this work. We have some experience now on a proof of concept that we're doing as well on the hub under the Let's Get Technical Project Unify. And a community has come together from a technical perspective to begin to look at solutions that are crossing sectors. So as you look at the hub, you'll notice there's a social determinant group, there's a proof of concept, there's a number of different groups that are coming um, on there that all are actually interwoven. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity that is beginning to, to percolate that actually will inform this work um, as well as that. And I see Chris uh, asked a really important question here is how are we gonna measure the success of our efforts? Um, I know that Chris, you've been involved with that for a long time as many other people on this call have as well. And so I hope that you can help us uh, sort of define that in many ways uh, as we go forward. And if you have a quick, uh, a quick answer, the golden, the golden nugget, I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, no, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, no, I actually don't have an answer. I was really uh, listening and trying to be very, I mean, I think before you can answer that question, you have to decide on sort of what the target, what, what are you trying to improve? And I've heard a number of things at the policy level. I'm also hearing things at the, sounds like at the practice level, although it seems like it's more state oriented practice level, I'm not sure I'm hearing a lot of things on the ground and that's not a negative. I'm just trying to understand what's the real focus of what we are saying we want to do beyond improve social determinants of health. So this is this is Karen. It, just to say that um, we we very intentionally not decided the four of us who've been talking about launching this conversation uh, just the answer to that question because what we really want this to be is we just we know that we want to see action more action than we've seen on addressing the social determinants of health. Daniel's just elucidated all the reasons why this is probably a good time to do that. What exactly that agenda looks like. Um, we're hoping will come out of these conversations and the work that happens in between times. And I agree very strongly that we need to have for each item, if you will, or area within the action agenda, we should very explicitly um, make, make clear what, what does success look like and, and, and then be tracking that. Um, I'm, I'm the, the high level fuzzy, um, you know, we, sh we should address poverty, drive me crazy because um, <laughs> if we, and some things will have very, um, I mean, if we come up with particular plays like, um, you know, advancing accountable communities for health, which is, is one model that's practical and being used, that's actually happening. They're slowly growing. So what, what do we think um, that, uh, how do we evaluate whether that is, working or not working. It would be an example of one kind of, the other would be of the policies um, that, that we're um, proposing as high priority policies, are we getting traction on those? Are they working? Are they being adopted at local levels or state levels or the federal level? So I think it's a mix of things because, but we don't really know what the action agenda is like. We really want people to start um, helping craft it.
So, I mean, that's great. I think, you know, there's multiple ways to do things and I think we just have to decide. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. So, uh, Mike, could you advance a couple of slides? I want to just show one thing that I was uh, recently impressed with. I'm not sure if people have seen that. There it is. I'll go back up one. Sorry. Yeah, that one there. So a little while ago, and 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 um, we looked at this. It's it it was it, it hasn't passed, but it is a Senate it is a Senate bill that is establishing an interagency council on social determinants, um, and this is December 2019. I, I put this up there, uh, not that it itself may pass, but there certainly may be a lot of legislation and appropriations coming uh, soon with obviously the increase in funding across uh, across COVID and the, the, our public health response to it. Um, I'm, was, I was delighted by this to see that there's actually thinking going on in Congress about a, a bill that's being uh, put out there. I, there's a link to it on the slide that we'll put up there, you can read through it. But it is, you know, the beginning maybe of a recognition, uh, Chris, to your point of like what and who and how should we do this? There may be a need, I, I firmly believe there is a need to coalesce a, a, a thinking around what is, you know, what is important at the national level, how do we focus this work, whether or not it's on the interoperability piece of things so that this work can actually happen, on the policy, on all sorts of other areas that we've touched upon. So I think moving this conversation forward with this coalition will be very productive. Um, and I think that um, uh, I think that that's an exciting piece of work that we're looking forward to. You see it in the you see it in other areas in the philanthropic world. You see some of that work both on RWJF, Kresge, California Healthcare Foundation, others. I know that within the academic community we're seeing that and and. Clearly, we're seeing that in some of the in some of the programs that have uh, that have recently uh, been been released out there. Um, I know it'll take time. Well, I think we all know it'll take time, but I think we do have a moment here to uh, to take advantage of that. And I will um, sort of implore folks to um, uh, jump on the hub, Mike. If you can advance two to the next steps, and then we'll close out the call today. Um, uh, there you go. So join the hub, uh, contribute content. Uh, there's plenty of ways to add your commentary to it. Uh, and we'll put up a place to, we'll put up a, a site soon or a, an opportunity for people to, uh, to, uh, uh, to identify that they're interested in participating in the action agenda. You can email us directly or put it on the hub. We'll, we'll create a space for people who can wanna do that. As I said earlier, we, we are uh, planning a series of webinars. Um, with other partners and colleagues. I know our colleagues at, at uh, Stanford are, are very interested in this work and there's a lot of effort with, within the uh, uh, looking at social determinants. I mentioned earlier, uh, AHRQ has got focus on this area and other organizations. So we'll be hopefully bringing all those voices together and hopefully some of our partners at ASTO and NATO um, will also contribute. And there's a lot of work going on across the country. If there's a way we can help sort of nurture that, move that forward, uh, um, being a you know a, an NGO that that will also be that will be helpful, and lastly you know really define a research agenda that can really drive the kinds of questions that we may not have answers to right now. Um, and so the last couple slides are just the upcoming uh, conferences that we'll be holding, uh, which I think will continue to add context. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks we have uh, Tiffany Manuel who will talk about not only about the data but also race equity and, and some of the issues that we've started to touch on a little bit today uh, and how we use information more effectively. Next slide. Um, this is an, a really interesting one, in my opinion. We've participated in a little bit on the public library's response to the opioid crisis. Um, they, uh, they have done an amazing job identifying a number of use cases. What was exciting about this was learning that there were, I didn't know this, 17,000 libraries across the country Talk about trusted uh, stewards in their community, uh, learning a whole lot about opportunities for disseminating uh, good ideas and information. Um, and I invite you to participate in that. Just brilliant work that's happening there. Excited to have them on board. Uh, and then the, um, uh, some of us, who many of you may know from 100 Million Healthier Lives and the WIND Network, um, will uh, will talk to us and some of the great work they're doing on national metrics. 
uh, and measures uh, will be very exciting as we start to think about kind of standards and how we approach this work going forward. So with that, um, I think we're at 1.30. Um, thank you so much uh, to Karen, PG, the rest of the stewards team, the Nick participants and all of you who've joined. Look forward to seeing you online, seeing you next week and um, keep your cards and letters coming. Thanks for your support and uh, have a safe <laughs> weekend in hibernation. Uh, uh, we'll see you all soon. Um, keep the conversation going. Thanks so much, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Daniel. And we'll post this. Care, thank you. Bye, everyone.